a great start. While I'm waiting, hello everyone. Um, my name is Eric. I don't know what he said about me, and I hope it was nice. Um, I work at the Natural History Museum in London, and I have a massive soft spot for flies. And I know obviously most of you in this room already do, but I have come across quite a lot of people that don't like flies. And I'm like, why? They're adorable, they're cute, they're lovely. So I thought, you know what? It's about time you general public got to really know them. So in a foolhardy motion, I decided to write a book about them because I wanted to explain everything that was funky. Now, I know that in literature, no one talks about a fly in a good way, okay? They've written whole books about how disgusting they are. They're even referred to as the devil, which I think is a little bit harsh, because, you know, they're fine. And if there's any taxonomists in the room, that actually is a bee, not a fly. So I'm just saying. Always the bees get the good press, and the flies get the crap press. So that's fine. And I can understand in many ways, because this is how we think about flies, hanging around feces. And what do they do on feces? They just vomit. And we don't like that sort of thing, especially as they walk through the feces, walk onto our food. And we're like, ooh, that is revolting, they're vomiting, they're defecating, they're passing all this crap on, okay? But this is, this is look, this is a beautiful fly. I mean, how can you not like those eyes? It's marvelous eyes. So we don't like them. And this little lady causes more heartache and grief than a most. So mosquitoes arguably are some of the biggest vectors on the planet. Now, I have looked up this fact. No mosquito per se has ever killed a human, okay? No, for a mosquito to kill a human, to exsanguinate our body, you need 404,000 mosquitoes feeding off you in one event. Just saying that doesn't happen, okay? They have killed some cows, which has been quite entertaining apart from the cow, but they've got all sorts of things going on. And of course, this, um, because I love my science, this is my blood. I was quite proud that I spent ages waiting doing that. My students didn't think I was so good. But I was, so I do understand, they're transmitters of these uh, malaria, they're transmitters of all these viruses, etc. Bad creatures. Nothing can come out of these little things. Now, playing homage to my Scottish heritage, this is the Highland Midge, okay? And these the Americans call no see -ems, okay? Tiny little blood-sucking females, because as all you males know, it's only the females that are the blood-suckers. And these little, but she's only because she's a mother, okay? So you can't have a go at her for that. And the thing is, you've got to like these flies because no other animal has spawned a fashion range quite as exciting as this lot. Like, this is, this is, you know, many, one of the reasons you're probably, we're, you know, the Scottish have got a bad reputation of being crazy is because this is how we walk around the countryside. This is how we mow the lawn. I like the fact that this male has probably decided it's better to go out and mow the lawn in this condition than face his wife. It's just that, uh, yeah, okay, she's had it. So, they're, they're, you know, there's nothing, nothing good about these creatures. See? I am just going to leave it at this slide and go, because look at how adorable they are. These, these are little powder puffs, flying, fluffy powder puffs. Absolutely, look, 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 look at the little mouth part. Come on. I mean, obviously, their larvae eat the insides out of bees, but hey, can't have everything in an animal, can you? So I, I was like, look, come on, I deal with this collection. I have maybe four million specimens I have to look after. And um, I get really sidetracked. So you, your boss comes along, have you done any work? No, but look at this fly. So, uh, okay. So what is one of the great reasons that I like flies? Well, flies take everything you think about nature and just throw it in your head. And you're like, oh, Jesus, really? So, for example, they get everywhere. So the first, if you've all got your t-shirts, the first animal sent to space was a fly. Um, not just because they have wings, because not always do they have wings, because this is a weird looking fly. So this is one of four species of marine midges, marine, 
and it hangs around the Caribbean and all nice, you know, Thailand, just off the beaches, having fun. And I haven't yet persuaded the British government to give me money to go and find them. I'm working on that. So what they are, though, is that they're flightless. So the larvae, and most of the life cycle is spent as the larvae, are just swimming around in the sea, eating. And then the male, of which these are two males, pop to the surface, burst through the top of the, the sea, and they, these the wings, these kind of like lumpy paddles out the side, do exactly that. So the males row around the top of the ocean. And what they're doing, is they're waiting for the female. Now, she can't be bothered to even go out to the surface because she's got it sussed. So what she does, like every good female, is she sticks her genitalia up in the air through the surface of the sea, and the male has to row around to find her. Okay? Now, this is quite funny, but as an adult, he's only alive for two and a half hours. As an adult female, she's only alive for half an hour. Yeah, come on, men, get your game on. So, you know, they get everywhere. There's lots of them, okay? Oh, God, Darwin and his fondness of beetles, I get it. And there is a legacy of more beetles being described than any other animal on the planet. And yeah, that's because they're easy. Lepidoptera, lepers, as I call them, they're the butterfly and moth specialists. And they're the ones who rang around with gay abandon, going, oh, pretty, pretty butterflies, pretty moths. And I'm like, yeah, they're OK, but they don't bite, maim, kill, and shred. So I'm not really interested in them. So instead, you've got the next big order, Hymenoptera, which are the bees, wasps, and ants, and Diptera, the true flies. Now, these have been totally underestimated globally. We are just beginning now to look properly at, at all of these species. And the thing is, they're hard. I am really good at fiddling with genitalia. It's my profession. I do it at home, do it at work. You know, I've dropped some, which has um, involved me on the lab floor. <laughs> Trying to find. That's why I make a really good girlfriend, because I'm used to genitalia that big. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, men in the room. Um, but what we're doing now is we're going back, we're looking at second generation technology in terms of sequencing. We are being able to actually identify correctly historic material in our collections. So I'm running a project at the moment called Neandersquito, and I'm going back and I'm sampling the genome of mosquitoes that are 100 years old. So me and thousands of other little me's around the world are doing this in all their collections. And we worked out, there's some crazy Canadian dudes who basically looked at their fauna, how much was described, looked in through their collections, worked out the estimates of what was really going to be there. And in just one family of flies, they realized they had massively underestimated the global estimate. So in just one family of flies, they figured out there's probably 1.1 million species. We've described 10,000 from that family. So we have a little bit of work to go. And they're, they're so diverse, right? There's, there's just, there's 13 quintillion insects alive at the moment or something like that. You've got a lot, I mean, in you, on you. I won't go into all the other bits. But you have lots of these, and they're amazing, they're variety. For example, like the UK, there's many reasons we don't like the UK at the moment. But one of them, you know, we do know our fauna. That's, that's one of the things. We know our, you know, I was going to make an immigrant joke, but probably not appropriate. Um, we know what species are there. We've been studying it for 300 years. Globally, there are 6,100 species of mammals on the planet. There is more than 7,000 species of fly alone in the UK. So there's a lot. And what's so better about them is that they are able to adapt their life cycle um, accordingly. So this, for example, this look at this little cute thing. This hangs around your drains. You'll see it in the kitchen. I describe them as like Superman, because they've got a cape and they're like, yeah, running around. I'm a fly, yeah. And um, they eat feces, which is kind of nice. Uh, but they go through this complete metamorphosis. So you have an egg stage and up to four larval stage, this fantastic pupil stage, 
where they basically dissolve most of their internal tissues and reorganize it to the adult stage. And most of the life cycle is the eating stage, the larval stage. So, for example, if I was a fly, this is the life cycle. I'm an egg, I'm a larvae, I just eat, 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 adult, shag, die. That is it. And nothing is better than that in a life cycle. So, for example, here is an uh, immature look, jazz hands. So, this is an image for black fly, and it lives in aquatic, fast flowing rivers. Okay? And it filter feeds its food. But so, as that's what a larvae, but the adult looks beautiful. She's, um, she's a beast and a half. She um, is just concentrated on feeding on your blood. Now, this was a, a very entertaining little story in the UK because if we can shove alcohol into our system, we would try it. And there was a huge outbreak of these flies down in Dorset. So the local brewery in Dorset went, do you know what, I'll invent a beer for it and I'll just stick ginger in it and people will buy it. It's true. And four pints of that and you're fine. So it's good. But we're taking this um, ability of this change in their life cycle for our own advantage. So for the fisher folks amongst you, this is a blood worm. And this is quite extraordinary because it's bright red. Bright red because it's got heme. Okay? It's kind of got blood. But its blood system, its hemoglobin, is way more efficient than ours. Okay? These can live in amazingly anoxic environments. But each time they change from growing, so they develop their larval stage, they leave their external skin behind. And one of the things is this little insert is the head capsule of these midges. Now, if you see on the head capsule, there's the row of teeth. Now, I can identify, well, I can't, people can, identify every species by this arrangement of teeth. They're that specific, okay? And what is amazing is that each spe uh, species has a specific oxygen requirement in the environment. So we are going back and digging ice cores, and by looking at what midge is there, I can tell you the climate temperature at that time. So we have this midge thermometer, so we can go back and look at previous climatic events, but we can also look at what's happening now when it comes to climate change. Now, we don't like them because they feed on feces and dead bodies, uh, but, you know, and if you ever get to the Natural History Museum in London, look up at the towers, because that's where we keep all the dead pigs, watching all the maggots coming out of them. I was asked to remove that slide, I'm just saying. You could have seen decomposing, um, we're not allowed dead humans in the UK, there was a little bit of issue with grave digging, and um, no one's kind of forgiven us except for that. But we are utilizing their, their, their ability to eat rotten flesh, be it dead or living, for our own advantage. So, look, this is the backside of a maggot. So they're not eyes, they're little anal spiracles. I know, you've just said ara and anus. Just saying. So what they're doing is these little things are able to consume our flesh. Now, we've been using this. Genghis Khan, when he was marauding across Asia, took wagon loads of maggots to stuff on his soldiers' wounds because they would eat the rotting flesh. And in eating the rotting flesh, they would also prevent gangrene. And now, thanks to our, uh, our diets, our life cycles, we're getting all sorts of things like type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes leads often to secondary complications such as ulcerating wounds, so gaping flesh. Again, I didn't give you the slide of that. Now, what we can do is we can stuff these maggots into those gaping wounds, and they will eat all this decomposing flesh, plus they're releasing an enzyme which binds your tissue. So it's able to create better um, uh, recovery, plus it gets rid of all the bacterium. So MRSA, which is a huge issue in hospitals nowadays, these little munchy maggots are getting rid of it. You will be glad to know, um, we don't just put loads of maggots on you anymore. They're in kind of like a little tea bag, which is quite cute, it's quite British. Oh, tea bag, lovely. <laughs> so yeah, I hang around a lot of shit. This is my, uh, you know, this is what I do. This is my holiday snap. Um, and it's not. I'm not that, well, no, yeah, I am. But anyway, so I, I do like, um, <laughs> I, I do flies and shit. That's my professional title. Um, I, so one of the good things is that they are getting rid of our feces. They are getting rid of it. An elephant defecates like a ridiculous 
was it 30 tons a year? But can you imagine if none of that was got rid of? You'll be swimming in a quagmire of feces. There be rotten bodies traveling down the stream of feces. Oh, look, there's Uncle Jeremy. And so we need these to get rid of, uh, of our waste. And this little babe, I mean, it's gorgeous. Look, it's called a soldier fly because they wear little uniforms. Uh, yeah, we think we're funnier than we actually are. Um, so this is a little soldier fly, and this specifically is Hermatia elucens, and this is basically going to be the planet's saviour, because this likes nothing more consuming absolutely tons of feces. And what we're doing is we're making maggot factories everywhere. In the UK, we've got three maggot factories now. Yay! And because their larvae are bred alongside, say, pigs or chickens, and so when these animals defecate, uh, the little larvae are like, brilliant, lunch. And they eat all this waste. And then, when they pupate, then they get fed back to the chickens or the pigs. So it's this amazing life cycle, apart from the fly, because that obviously it's dead, but it's really good. Because, and we are beginning to use this for our own diet. Obviously, the ones we consume are not fed on feces. Even I'm not that cruel to you. Uh, and what they do, why it's so good for us to eat them, is because they're absolutely protein-packed. They're jam-packed with omega-3. And so we're not overfishing, and we're not over-farming. So insects don't fart, okay? That's my uh, yeah, takeaway line from today. Insects don't fart. But this is really handy, because cows do fart. Cows fart an awful lot. Do you know, I get this is my years of education to be able to stand up in front of you and go, yeah, cows fart, uh, just in case you didn't realize that. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so what is really good is that we're able to have all this protein without being environmental damaging. You can go home tonight and on Amazon, you can buy your own little maggot farm and you can put it in your kitchen. It's like, oh, look. And then you can like, have really nice compost, get a 3D printer, you can convert this into like a paste, print out a burger. It's amazing. Now, so here's another one of these decomposing maggots. And um, I do, obviously, because I've mentioned anal spiracles. Who doesn't like a good anal spiracle? And this one has one of the best anal spiracles out. It is enormous. And this is where we get a lot of complaints from the public going, there is something revolting in my compost, and I'm going to kill it. And we're like, do, 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 don't kill it. Because although, you know, this is a marvel in itself, because it's getting rid of a load of waste, it turns into this. OK? And this is where most people have got flies wrong, because most people don't realize they're some of the top pollinators on the planet. And this is one of the best pollinators in Europe, Aristolus tenax, a beautiful beast. Who doesn't like fluffy eyeballs? So, I mean, absolutely wonderful. She is, she gets in, and um, it's males and females. In fact, males, arguably, for once, are more efficient. Um, and he, <laughs> sorry, he gets in, and he does all this amazing pollination, because they have a lot more adaptable mouth parts. So, this is uh, Ringia Campestra. We can play the video. They're not that slow. So this is, and what they're amazing is that they keep their mouth parts in this kind of little hood to start with, and so it's got this, it's folds out, these mouth parts, to get into, and um, because we're, we think we're really funny, we call this the Heineken fly, which means nothing to you lot, because it was an advert, probably before most of you were born, about this lager in the UK that um, was so good at refreshing the parts of your body that other lagers couldn't get to because that fly was such a good pollinator at getting into the parts of flowers that other pollinators couldn't get into. We named it the Heineken fly. I have to lecture a load of undergrads, and they just sit there going, oh, it's not funny. I'm like, OK. Now, this, this is a magnificent pollinator. This is the hornet hoverfly. And um, she is a beast. She's a whopper. She scares the living bejesus out of 90% of the British public. And they're like, oh, I've got to kill it. I'm like, no, stop. Uh, because she is so efficient, she buzz pollinates like the bees. Like, I don't know who got involved with the bees, but their press is way better than flies. Okay? And everyone's like, save the bees, save the bees. I'm like, no, flies. My campaign is a, is a little smaller, arguably, 
I know this, but I am working on it. And what we're doing is I work with another 400 people like me running around the British countryside monitoring all these flies. So any time a new fly turns up in the UK, doo -doo -doo, we're off. It's like, gotta go, gotta my fly cape, go and find the fly. So this one turned up in the UK in the 1930s. It's very European, it didn't like the weather. It's like, nope, I'm only gonna go to the south. And then, ooh, then it thought, do you know what, I quite like this, and started migrating. And we have been able to look back through our collections, and our collections at the Natural History Museum date specifically from the first fly that was caught in 1680, and it was caught by the gardener of the Queen in Hampton Court. See, that's how we start our collections. Like, yeah, a little bit of royalty. But um, what is amazing is that now we've gone go back through all of these. And because fly people are a little nerdy in comparison to the moth people and the beetle people, I know, can you believe that? Um, we have kept really good records because we're like, like so specific. Uh, we make really good friends because we're quite desperate. Because we're like, yeah. Um, so we've kept all these records, so we're able to say this. So when the government was talking, and especially Risi, from the noughties to the twenties, we've seen a massive shift going on. So when they talk about climate change, we're like, doof, doof. there you go, thank you. Look at this beast. It's one of my, fa no, well, actually, it's not one of my favorites because I've got 50 million favorites. But this is, this is, because flies are so specific, they, uh, plants involve flowers just for the insects, to get them pollinating, because they're efficient pollinators. And this one is even more efficient, because this has an exceptionally long mouth part. If this fly was a human, your tongue would be six meters long. Yeah. Now, what's even funnier, because unlike the moths and whatever who wrap up their mouth parts, this can't. This flies along with its head down, <laughs> just ignoring the other insects, going to shut up. I know, it's fine. And it's going in there, and it is a gilled pollinator. If you get rid of this one species of fly, eight species of plant die out immediately. And this is found in South Africa. So I, uh, I have a terrible job where I have to spend many months traveling around the world in really nice locations looking for flies. I know. And the nice thing about flies is I can basically pick wherever I want to go because there's a fly there, like, brilliant. I want to go to Mongolia. Oh, is there flies? Of course there are. Um, so I spent three weeks in South Africa collecting these flies. Oh, they're so cute. Um, but we're also now thinking about them in terms of bio-inspiration, because what they're able to do is they can manipulate their mouth part at any point. So we are looking at this when it comes to surgery, when it comes to smart needles. Because if a mosquito can get her mouth part into you without you realizing it, when it comes to doing surgery, that's a really useful technique. Look at this. <laughs> I, I promised myself not to dance on stage. Promised myself, failed. Right, this is obviously one of the cutest. It's the best animal in the UK. Okay, this is Bombilius Major. Look at her, marvelous. And again, like really good pollinators as adults, really quite fun is because she, uh, her larvae eat baby bees. Yes. And what she does is she's got this bum pouch and she twerks. Uh, I'm not doing that. I, I have limits. I'm not twerking for you lot. She twerks and then she lays her egg midair, catches it, she ravels it in the gravel, and then she hurls it. She's the best mother on the planet. And this, so not only does it act as a ballast, it also acts as a desiccant. So hopefully, till the conditions are perfect for the larvae, it can stay in that bit. And if I can't convince you about flies being good pollinators, then none of you like chocolate. Now, I think chocolate is the most disgusting substance on the planet. It just slimes you, I don't get it. It's revolting. But chocolate is only pollinated by 15 species of midge, and annoyingly recently, um, they found a moth that did it, so I was like, damn it. But the plant itself, the cocoa plant, is basically like the panda of the plant world. It's absolutely crap at having sex, okay? It's got a really complicated internal tube system, so only the smallest of the small of the small can get in to pollinate it. So harking back to Scotland and those really annoying midges, actually the males 
of that family are the things that pollinate chocolate. So you get rid of your biting midges, you get rid of mosquitoes, you get rid of a load of pollinators. And we are, because they're clearly, because of your, your, not mine, your insatiable appetite for this revolting stuff, they're growing it in, in monocultures. And in these monocultures, they've got rid of the habitat that the adults like to have adult time in, and they've got rid of the larva habitat. So we are basically wiping out this species of insect. Irony. They don't just pollinate all things good. There's a saprimyophilic species. These go to plants that pretend they're rotten flesh. <laughs> so I, some, some plants are quite sneaky, and I quite approve of that. So here you go. You've got a flesh fly on the left, and it's covered in pollen. I've seen mosquitoes flying around with massive pollen balls on their eyes. How they can see, well, whatever. And then this one on the right, this one captures the flies. It's got guard hell cells and won't release the fly till it's covered it in a load of pollen. And then it lets it go. Evil plants. So they're really good pollinators. It's not just pollinators they do well, they predate. Okay, ah, I love this. So yeah, harking back to South Africa, you've got this lovely little researcher, keen, enthusiastic, I'm running around the countryside trying to find mosquitoes. So what you've got here is two larvae mosquitoes. You've got this little one, which is actually the one I'm trying to find. It's like, ah, oh, it's a very important species. I'm trying to incriminate it for what it's passing on. Unbeknownst to me, I got one of these, am I allowed to swear? Uh, fat fuckers, okay? And basically, I've captured it. I've put it in little bowls at night. I've organized my little research lab. I'm very smug, everything is labeled, everything is great. I've come back down the next morning, and this thing has eaten every other mosquito in the bowl. It's not funny. That's, that's British taxpayers' money going down the drain. And so I was like, ah, no! And you can almost see it just looking at me going, yeah, thanks. But, I mean, this seems bad for me, but it's actually very good for you. Because we are using these as biological control. We are just dumping in the environment because they just prefer mosquito larvae. They're like, oh, really? For me? And it's like, yes, go on, little ones. So these little predators are going out and helping us in the countryside. It's not just the larvae that are the predators. Well, this is another larvae. This is a hoverfly larvae. So hoverflies, you know, they eat, they eat waste as larvae, but 40% of them eat aphids. So they are such an important gardener's friend. And this is such a cute little, like, sucking the insides out of aphids. And I, I'm, you know, and there's nothing nicer than watching aphids go, uh, So if you get an opportunity, go home, watch the aphids in the garden. And what they're um, doing is that these, the larvae of the hoverfly have raised the aphid up. Because the aphid is like, friends, go, run. I'm releasing a distress pheromone. I'm telling you to get out of here. Uh, but the larvae is like, the hoverfly is like, ah, I'm clever. I'm going to raise you higher than the rest of the aphids. So this distress pheromone goes over their heads. So there's the uh, hoverfly larvae is like, hey, look, I'm going to eat you going to eat you, and we'll just maraud around. They can eat like 40 to 50 aphids in one feeding event. Brilliant. It's just, your garden is death and carnage. I kind of describe it like a 1980s town disco. They're either trying to shag each other or kill each other. That is what's going on. So here we go. Here's a beautiful adult. This is a robber fly. I adore robber flies. My necklace is a robber fly. It was given to me by an ex. The good thing about me is you'll never know where my exes are because I can get rid of the bodies. Uh, but this is quite amazing because these are top predators. Any time the BBC does a documentary about predators, I'm going ape at home going, where's the robber flies? Because these, and you've got to admire them because even the females have moustaches, so I'm already there. So these are top predators, but they're venomous, okay? They are, we have described 10 new venoms to science from just this family alone. So these are part of the neglected venoms groups. Any time a mosquito bites you, it's injecting a little bit of venom into you. Okay? So next time, marvel at all the amazing things going on as it's giving you dengue. So these are great. There's 10 new... Um, the, the family is called Acillidae, so we've called these venoms acillins, 10 new to science. They're not harmful to us. This is one of my friend's nostrils, and obviously this is Acillus crebronophormis on his nose. So what we do, just to freak the public out, is walk around with these little beasts on our nose. Because, yeah, we're, we're trying to make sure people think we're sane. These. Oh, come on. 
Right, take your image of what you thought was a fly and then just scrap it, okay? These are amazing. These are in part of a super family called Hippobosoidea, okay? And these are specifically strebs, streblidae, okay? And these are ectoparasites. These live on the backs of bats. And they're so cute. So obviously, like, when I'm not in South Africa, I have to spend a month in the Caribbean every year. Uh, no, it's hard. It's hard. Um, I'm doing field work with rum. It's like, <laughs> um, and what I'm doing is at night, we're catching the bats, and I'm collecting. These look like little drunken spiders running around going, yeah, 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 catch me. Now, I don't know if you've ever sampled a bat, um, but they get angry quite quickly. And you have to kind of keep them open splayed so they're males with testicles everywhere. And then I'm trying to, with a pair of really sharp forceps, at like 12 o'clock at night, remove flies off them. It's not always been successful and there's been a few stabbings, but hey, they're mammals, we can get more. But what is amazing about these parasites, and, and they're the same super family as the tetsi and all of that, is that they give birth to live young. So we think this is something only mammals do, but no, these flies, she's got internal lactating glands, so she's got tits on the inside. And what she does is she rears up her larvae, and just before it's about to pupate, she backs off the bat onto the cave wall, lays her larvae, squishes it with her derriere, and then she leaves it. Great mother. And then some of them just look amazing. Isn't it the best photo? It's like, oh, I make Christmas cards out of this. Yeah. And what's amazing is they've got rid of their wings because they're hanging around bats, so they don't need wings. And they, so they've got rid of all their muscles on their back. So when the head is not feeding, it just pops back onto the back of the body. So, look at their claws. Can you imagine that crawling around you? No? Oh, you haven't lived, folks. Now, look, here, look, this is a teddy bear. It's like, come on, he's adorable. With it. Obviously, this is a fly, because, yeah, it looks just like a fly. Those little lumps you see on the front of the head, they are not eyes. This species has no eyes. This species runs around the back of bees. I kind of like to think of it as the, like, you know, the hell's angels of the insect world, hanging around the bee going, yeah, look at me, hey. And what they are is they're kleptoparasites. So they are feeding on the waste food around the mouth part of the queen bee. Now, unfortunately, there was this thing called varroa mite, okay? And varroa mite came into all the bees. And this family of flies, they only live on the honeybee. So they were quite happily living with the bees, going, hi, can I clean your mouth? Yeah, okay. And uh, they were fine. We then, from 1992 onwards, put this insecticide, this miticide, sorry, into the colonies of bees, and we wiped out all of these flies. So we eradicated a species in the UK. Now, they're talking about reintroduction of the lynx in the UK. I have a second campaign trying to get these reintroduced. Again, it's, it's not taken off. But I'd like to, because we have got a, you know, it's our uh, purpose in society is to kind of not destroy it. You've got, look at these. I mean, who doesn't? I have a really soft spot for parasites because, uh, you know, who doesn't? And these are squirted, their larvae get squirted up into the nostrils of a reindeer. So we affectionately call these snot bots. And it's quite nice. And what they do when they're about to pupate, they irritate the lining, so she, <laughs> she snots. Which, uh, if you've ever seen a camel do it, this is what you have to go home and YouTube. Look up camels fleming out snot bots. Uh, maybe not before lunch. Uh, but they're quite fascinating, okay? And there's three different types of bot fly. You've got the snot bots. You've got arguably the rarest animal on the planet in the next group, okay? Because this is found in the stomach lining of a rhinoceros, okay? So we're worried about rhinos dying out. Every time it's wild rhino day, <laughs> there's me, whoop, wild rhino bot fly day. And I just tag myself in, they go, oh God. Now this is an amazing, we have about 30 specimens in the UK, which is the largest collection in the world. Now the thing is, there is a slight health and safety issue with collecting these bot flies, because you have to find fresh rhino dung 
and sieve through it to find the larvae. Now, I don't know how many of you have hung around the backside of a rhino, but uh, I can't persuade many of my students to do it. Some people are so ungrateful these days. So there's them, and there's these. These are human butt flies, but this is one in the cow, and these are our subdermal. I've not had a butt fly yet. I'm basically a baby in the department. Until I've had a butt fly, I'm just like young and immature. So this is a piece of cow skin, and it's fabulous, and it sits on my desk. So new visitors are like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's this. As you turn it around, and these are all the warbles, all the larvae under the skin. And what's great about this, if you, is it, anyway, you've got to get your own one. When you get one, you can hear it at night munching. Okay, and that's what puts people off, as well as it defecating. So, you know, if you get it on your cranium, you, it's right next to the ear, and you can hear it, and then it's got its feces running down your face. And um, I tried to persuade my friend who got one to keep it for me, but he was a primatologist and had no, like, gumption, so I had to get it out of him, which is a shame. But it's in the collection, so that's positive. Now, moving on from the parasites, you've got the parasitoids. And the parasitoids, these ultimately result in the death of their host. So they're, they're even better in me. And these, these look at these lovely little hunchback dudes. Um, these are called spider-killing flies. So there you go, that's an indication of what they eat. And what is fabulous, she basically has a machine gun as an ovipositor, so she fires out up to 2,000 eggs in one go. She's like, she's taking this maternal thing and run with it. Now, hopefully, the eggs land on a piece of vegetation about knee high, and then when the larvae come out, and they're like little leech-like larvae, they're like, ooh, ooh, waiting for the spider to come running past. Now, larvae of flies have no legs, <laughs> and they have to run after spiders. So you can see them going, oh, oh, wait, wait. And what they do is they climb up the back leg of a spider, and the spiders are slightly different to insects in that they have a primitive lung in their abdomen, okay? It's called a box lung. And what the little larvae do is once it's got inside, it has a little bit of a munch, and then it connects its anal spiracle to the lungs and goes to sleep. And it waits till the spider is mature. So this is quite amazing, because in the UK, the spiders it feasts on live up to five years. So it will go to sleep for four and a half years. It's quite cool, but this little insect this one feeds on tarantulas, okay? I don't know if any of you have had a pet tarantula, quite cute pets. What you could do is when they melt their skin, stick it to the wall, so when people come round, you're like, oh, I've lost the tarantula. Oh, no, there it is. They didn't like that as an undergraduate. But what is fantastic about tarantulas is they can live between 15 and 25 years. So these flies, they have evolved to go into that period of dormancy for that long. So how on earth does that happen? That's why flies are amazing. Well, one of the many reasons why flies are amazing. So I will finish on this family of flies. Now, uh, this family, these little dudes, this is a dudette, sorry. Look at her massive genitalia. Fantastic creatures. And they come from a family of flies called forids. Now, I call forids horrid forids, just because they're really hard to identify. But they are arguably the most ecologically diverse family of animal on the planet. You name it, they do it. We have, part of them are called coughing flies, because when we bury bodies six foot under, they can find our bodies. Just saying, if any of you are going down that line of murder, you have to be quite specific where you bury the body. So they do that. There's ones that mimic termites. They live in termites' mouth. There's ones that um, they do all sorts of things. They live in our fungi, eat the fungi. There's a lot of them that like drinking. So there's a lot of drunken flies running around the countryside. It's quite cool. But these ones are ant decapitators, okay? And these are quite fun, just, you know, getting called an ant decapitator for a start is quite fun. So this ant is a bad ant, bad ant. She is a fire ant. And what is interesting about ants is that we have no anti-venoms for them, okay? We have anti-venoms for most other species on the planet apart from these ants. Now, these little ants went, woo, got a boat, left South America. It was like almost like a wagon going north to North America. Trump was in power at the time. So they happily got there, and they live in near and around houses. And they live in nests of 10,000 ants, 
Now, what is quite exciting is you only need 180 of them to kill a horse. So suddenly, it's like, ooh. And they haven't killed enough Americans as we'd like. But we have now, that don't record that. We are, we are now doing loads of biological control with them. So we've gone back to South America and we're like, okay, let's go and find these ants, specifically the ones that are working on these farm ants. And what she does, she's so cool, she will go down and she will slice through the back of an ant, because, you know, who doesn't do that? And then she lays a larvae in it, and the little larvae is like, excellent, crawls through the thorax, the back of the ant, crawls through into the head of the ant. Now, ants communicate a lot by their antennae, and what it's doing is this little baby fly is like eating for two weeks the inside of the head capsule of a fly, now, um, ant. Now, the thing is, this ant is still carrying on. Hello, I'm gonna get food for my queen. Yeah, it's very British, isn't it? Food for the queen. Um, so she would go on, she'll carry on doing all of this, and it's great. But what these ants do, uh, flies do, after two weeks, they're fabulous. They decapitate. So this is really good about them. And you might think that's a bit grim, but you know, they're very species specific. It's very important they do that. And after they've pupated in their amazing little castle, their protected environment, whoosh, out they pop. Look at that. Isn't that nice? It's like from death give birth to life. It's like a metaphor for all of us. And, and what there's a Amazing guy in uh, America, he's looking at these, he's Brian Brown, he's Mr. Forage. And he, he spends ages going through and finding them. And this is another species that again works on some of the bad ants. Bad ants, rogue ants. And what it does is when an ant's injured, and you know, an ant's like flailing, it's still quite a vicious little female. Uh, males are basically bred for one thing, they have sex, genitalia's ripped off, they die. Um, it's quite handy. Uh, but these little things, so they're trying to go up to the little females, and when the female is no longer able to protect itself, she saws its head off, which is quite nice, and then drags the head off. So there's some lovely videos of heads being dragged off. So the whole thing about the book was that I was able to go through, do a little romp of all these little stories. So it'll be on sale outside, please buy it. Thank you. Got the bug. <laughs>